Loudoun County Schools this week forced by a judge to release a report that they had conducted internally. They had hoped to keep it secret about a number of sexual assaults and Title IX violations that had taken place in the school district, but it is now out. And the findings from that report, well, let's get into the details with our next guest. Ian Pryor is the executive director of Fight for Schools, a senior advisor to America First Legal, and joins us now. Ian, good to have you back with us, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This uh, this report has been uh, much anticipated, and boy, I found I I know I, we know so much about this story, and I still found my jaw dropping as I read it. Tell me what what you took away from it, Ian. Yeah, well, this is something that we've we've certainly been trying to get since it was completed in in December of 2021. You know, I think it was a it was a little bit different from the the grand jury report, in that the grand jury report really focused on sort of the top levels of the administration, as well as what happened with these incidents, and was looking at it through, through a criminal lens. Um, whereas this report, you know, really just stayed on, on the bottom level. Um, I, don't, I don't think they wanted to go to, you know, Scott Ziegler and, and sort of top staffers. Um, but I think it did a good job on the Title IX piece, which, you know, the, the grand jury touched upon, um, but that really wasn't their, their focus. But I think this report really solidified a lot of the things that, that we had, had known and had talked about and had demanded, um, which is they failed their obligations under, under federal Title IX. And, you know, they, they also didn't do a, a threat assessment, which is not something that you know, we had talked a lot about. Um, but it just goes to show that, you know, there was, there was a complete, uh, complete negligent, uh, grossly negligent behavior from the top all the way down in Loudoun County Public Schools. And, you know, the fact that they fought so hard for this to stay behind closed doors tells you, I think, everything you need to know about it. Yeah. So the 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 big story here that kicked off so much of the attention uh, was the 2021 sexual assault of Scott Smith's daughter uh, at Stonebridge High School. And that was right at the end of the school year that this this occurred. This was two weeks before the end of the school year. Uh, the assault occurs inside of um, a women's re a girl's restroom. Uh, and that kicks off a series of events where the school is trying to handle it and keep it quiet and not sure what to do. And then the boy gets transferred and it's just another week or so into the new school year at a different high school that he commits yet another sexual assault. Uh, what did you think of this portion of the report? Well, I, I thought there were some some interesting details in there that showed, you know, just how disingenuous the, the school district had been. Been, right? They said, well, you know, we didn't know the kid was arrested. Um, you know, we, we didn't learn about it. And this was in the special grand jury report. We didn't learn about it because the probation officer <clears throat> sent the notice and it, it ended up in the wrong mailbox. All right. Well, on July 20th, according to this report, um, you had the, the mother of the first victim saying, where's the Title IX investigation? Right. So they have an opportunity at that point to, to start a Title IX investigation. Um, they could have asked what, you know, what, what happened with the kid? Is he, has he been charged, et cetera? Right. Um, August 17th in that report, it says that the, um, the mother of the perpetrator actually brought it to their attention um, that he, he, there's a court order saying he couldn't go back to the school. So that should have raised some alarm bells with the LCPS administration saying, totally. well, if there's a court order, then I guess it's been adjudicated at some level. We should probably look into this. But they didn't do that. They didn't want to do that. Um, they didn't start this Title IX investigation of the first assault until after the second assault took place. Right. And, you know, what's, what's really striking is if you go back to October 15, 2021, Scott Ziegler is out there um, in front of Loudoun County Public Schools giving a press conference. He's got the chairwoman at the time, Brenda Sheridan. He's got two other school officials behind him. And he says, oh, you know, we were hamstrung by Title IX because of you know, the Trump DeVos amendments. And it really limited what we could do. Well, no, that's not what your own report said. Your own report said actually obligated you to do something. So it was just another example of, of Scott Ziegler going out there and being disingenuous to the public. Yeah. And then as far as the perpetrator is concerned, remember so much of the early drama was wrapped up uh, in whether or not this boy was pretending to be a girl in order to gain access to the girl's restroom. Uh, Loudoun County, of course, was uh, trying to push through a policy to allow boys into the girls' restrooms at the time. Uh, all the more, uh, un unfortunately, cruel incentive for them to keep all of this quiet. And the reality here in the report now that we see this is that apparently the boy identified as something called pansexual. Uh, he would wear dre dresses and skirts and kilts to school. He would wear fishnet gloves 
from time to time, but one of the bizarre details that was also added in addition to what I just read you is that apparently a ton of the kids in the school dressed like this, and he was m one of the more subdued students in terms of their outfit. What does that tell you about what's going on in these Loudoun County high schools? Well, I think it, it tells you that there is a social contagion uh, and that, that people are, you know, kids are doing these things in order to, to get attention and stand out. Um, and the report talked about how this kid wanted attention. You know, the, the report, obviously, it, it missed a key fact, which is that, you know, the SRO there testified both, it seems before the special grand jury, but also at Wade Byard's trial, that this kid told him he was, he was gender fluid. And, and so the left made this big to do about, you said he was transgender and, and he wasn't. Well, first of all, I don't ever recall saying that, but to the people that did say that, if you go back to Ralph Northam's model policies, the ones that were being passed and that resulted in that being passed in Loudoun County, they use the term transgender as essentially anybody whose gender does not conform to their biological sex. It was a catch-all. So based right. on their own definitions, you know, it, how are you supposed to understand that? I mean, there's, you know, what, 72 different genders now. I, it's it's mind-boggling to think that um, you'd have to go through all those to get, uh, well, we've got a pansexual gender fluid kid if we're going to be very, very specific here. I mean, come on. I mean, if he's wearing skirts to school, he's calling himself pansexual, he rapes a girl in a bathroom and then goes on to another sexual assault at a different school, we're supposed to take this kid as the burning bush? I mean, he's he's the font of truth in all of this. I mean, like it, it's just ridiculous. And yet that's how the left handled this. It is. And, and, you know, while I do think, again, that the report did a good job analyzing sort of the, the Title IX deficiencies, um, it, you have to look at the report with a grain of salt as well, because this was commissioned by LCPS. And so they're not going to get into – yeah, did the school board members know about this? Which school board members knew? What did Scott Ziegler, who was the Title IX officer at the time, what was his involvement? How much yeah. did he know? They didn't do that, right? And then they said this thing about, well, the sheriff's office came in and threatened to arrest us. Okay, well, did you go follow up with the sheriff's office to see if that was true, or did you just throw that in there gratuitously so you could make you know, political hay when it was necessary? So you know, I think that the, you, you take the report – um, and, and some of the things certainly I think are, are concerning. Some of the things they, they clearly didn't do what they needed to do. Uh, but, but beyond that, one of the things that was the most striking was that it said in the 2021-22 school year, there were 159 reports under Title IX, 159. So this report was done in December, so that means four months, 159 reports, and not one of them opened an investigation. I mean, if you're in corporate America and you're the CEO and in a four-month period, you have 159 reports of Title VII violations, discrimination, sexual harassment, and you do nothing, you're getting fired. And the fact that the school board had this report in January of 2022 and didn't, not only didn't fire Scott Ziegler, they gave him a massive raise over the summer. So this is on them, too. I mean, if I was a parent with a kid at that school, I'd be freaking out now uh, and, and for these past few years. But especially these, these details coming out that you've got all of these allegations and they're going uninvestigated. That's that's an unsafe environment for a kid. It's an unsafe environment. And I'll throw out another fact. You know, when this school board, the one that's currently in power, when they took over in January of 2020, they put on the agenda you know, that first month um, changes related to Title IX. Right. And um, that sat there for over two years. They did nothing. They never acted on it. They never passed it. It wasn't a priority for them. While all this stuff is going on, they neglected their duty as school board members. Yeah, well, that's for sure. I noticed, by the way, that the report has redactions throughout it. Uh, not in some cases, the not big ones. But do we know what's behind those redactions? Uh, yeah, I mean, that would basically be, you know, personal identifiable information, identified information about the victim, the perpetrator's names, uh, the victim's names, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that was actually done by the attorney general's office um, when they submitted this yesterday, this redacted copy, uh, so that the report could be unsealed. Now, you know, the chair of the school board said, well, we would have had much more in, in the way of reaction. And we actually had one school board member, uh, Eric Ogadegbe, uh, out in Leesburg, who, you know, she campaigned on, oh, we need to release the report. And then when the grand jury report came out, we need to release the report. And then somebody got to her before February because she said, well, we'd have to redact it so much that, that the report would just be useless. Well, uh, it's not redacted that much, and I think it's pretty useful. And it's clear that, you know, you didn't want to vote for the report to come out 
because you knew it would make your colleagues, because she wasn't on the school board at the time, your colleagues look bad and might even hurt your own political prospects. What is what is it with, I mean, the, I don't even understand the decision making here, because if they were trying to avoid the pain of the scrutiny of the public, why not just release this while everybody was paying attention to it in the first place? Why create 100 news cycles <clears throat> where we find out more and more stuff about how awful it was in Loudoun County? I mean, that's a great question, and I've wondered that myself. You know, this, if this was done and, and completed in, in January of 2022, release it. it. Make some changes, fire people, release it, and then you're done. And then you have this investigation by the attorney general's office into what happened, but you can at least say, look, we did this. This is what we found. We made changes. Not, well, we made some changes to Title IX, but we kept everybody except for the one guy that we scapegoated. We got rid of him in January. Uh, but everybody else is still here, including the lawyer who is no longer there, um, but the lawyer who hired the firm to do the independent report and the lawyer who presumably was giving Scott Ziegler legal advice as he went out and gave a press conference where he completely uh, misrepresented what the school did um, and how they, they fulfilled their Title IX obligations, which they Big did time. not. Big time. Lying in that school board meeting about the sexual assaults in the bathrooms, just crazy what's ha what happens in uh, Loudoun County, what, what has been happening. Uh, thank you for constantly covering it with aggression on behalf of the people of Loudoun County, Virginia, and the country. Thank you, Ian Pryor. Good to talk to you today, sir.